Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to welcome Adrian Harpold here for his second um, seminar as part of the Ecology Speaker Series. Adrian was born in Seattle and grew up in the woods and streams of the Western Washington. His family moved to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and he attended nearby Virginia Tech University. At that time, Dr. Harpold solidified his love for hydrology while doing summer jobs as a whitewater rafting guide in Wyoming and field tech for the BLM and a semester exchange at USU right here. After receiving his PhD in 2010 from Cornell University, he took a postdoc research position in the Department of Hydrology and Water Resources at University of Arizona. An NSF postdoc fellowship took him to INSTAR at the University of Colorado Boulder. He started at the University of Nevada, Reno in the Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences Department in 2015, and he got tenure in 2020. He's the recipient of the AGU Hydrology Early Career Researcher Award and College's Rising Researcher Award and the Hari Fellowship at the University of Arizona. So very accomplished and we're super excited to have Adrian here. And now I'm gonna turn it over to him um, and then I'll pick back up at the end for questions. Thank you, Sarah. I just wanna say before I start, um, I'm exhausted from two days here, but it's been such a great experience for me. Um, I've been really impressed with the diversity of the students that have come to meet with me and um, getting to meet some faculty that I've read their papers and see seen their names for so long. It's just, it's been a treat, but I will be sleeping on the plane ride back tonight. Um, so to today, uh, I am going to try to kind of give a different flavor of my research than yesterday. Yesterday I was trying to think about water budgets in the mountains, where our water comes from, the concerns that we should have with climate change. Today is gonna to be a little more technically focused on water supply management through forest restoration and management. And I'm hoping to give a little extra time at the end for a sort of discussion question period. And there'll be a little bit of overlap uh, from yesterday, but uh, hopefully this will be mainly fresh for those that made both of the talks. <clears throat> so again, I'll do my take homes up front. There's a lot of disturbance vectors in our mountain forests and these disturbances come in different severities, they come in different types, and then they occur on different landscapes with different pre-existing conditions. And this sort of trifecta of complexity, um, I'm going to argue to you, is something we need to, to uh, have a handle on to make predictions. And one of the real challenges here is the uniqueness of place. Um, Logan Canyon, is uh, a limestone area and the effects of climate and forest disturbance on limestone geology can be very, very different than say a granite geology, even for the same elevations and similar climate. So how are we going to deal with all this uniqueness of place issues? And then on top of that, the things we're predicting are very important and they're important to predict with high precision and accuracy. Right, so not only do we have to deal with this trifecta of complexity, we need to do it in a way where we can say something about how certain or uncertain we are about our forecasts. Right, um, water supply forecasting is a is a relatively precise art where they're trying to get a, a number that they use to make decisions. So I'll go through kind of these pieces in the first half of the talk. My argument here is that we have some new tools in our toolbox through remote sensing, process-based modeling, and sort of big data analysis that might help us with this sort of trifecta of challenges here. Getting better uh, sense of, ooh, see, it was working. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. <laughs> uh, the different types of disturbances. So we have fire, we have, restoration and thinning, we have mortality from insects, uh, the, the disturbance severity, so is it moderate, severe, and then 
all these sort of poorly defined characteristics of place, which you could think about as what was the pre-existing ecosystem? What was its function? How much was that sort of mod modulated by the, the critical zone or the geology and the soils and the vegetation? So I'm gonna try to go through these and give some examples with the idea that um, maybe these new tools might be useful for other people in the room. Maybe you haven't seen some of them before. Maybe my application of them might resonate with you. A little bit of background. I, I'm not doing much background today because I felt like yesterday was a big overarching sort of background talk. But I, I want to make the point that to me, after all these years, it's obvious, but um, certainly it's not obvious to everybody, which is the sort of overlap or uh, coexistence of water, snow, forests, right? And it's not random that this occurs. It's, it's really driven by physical processes. We have more precipitation in our high elevations due to orographic lifting. So we get more precipitation in the mountains. We also have lapse rates. Uh, so it's cooler in the mountains. So the combination of uh, precipitation and cooler temperatures um, means less evaporative demand. It means more snow, less rain. And I, I always find this somewhat striking, right? When you overlay the mountains with the forest cover, or in this case, it's a above ground woody biomass, I mean, it is a very tight relationship, especially in the inner mountain west where we are, that's so water limited, right? So these are coexisting factors that are pretty much in all our mountain forests. Steep topography, snowfall, more precipitation than the lowland areas, and then a complex land use history. I think something I didn't appreciate early in my career was just how disturbed uh, from natural events and from humid events, really all the forests um, are in the Western US. And, and we need to think about that when we're thinking about disturbance and uniqueness of place. Here's a, a similar sort of graphic where I'm showing uh, the Rocky Mountain spine across, let's think throw me out. The, the northern New Mexico, Colorado into southern Wyoming. And I'm really kind of making a similar point here about the overlap of snow and forests in these two first two panels. And this, I need to go back and remake this figure because it's like, I don't want to tell you how old now, but uh, I think the data goes through what, 2013. So these are disturbances in the dot, the, the crosses are um, fires. The, the colors are insect disturbances in that same domain, right? So now I'm layering on sort of that disturbance vector to give you the sense of water, forest, disturbance, right? And this is really more the rule of, of these systems. You tend to have all these things occurring and um, certainly acceleration of disturbance uh, in recent years with climate change. I don't know what I did. I think it's going to come back. It will be back. Okay, it's fine. I showed this graphic yesterday, but I'm showing it again because I think it's really fascinating. And today I'm going to make a, one additional point with this that's really kind of more of the focus of today's talk, which is the water resources aspect. So what you're supposed to get away from, get from this graphic is that we have this sort of exponential increase in fires and um, both in, in the extent and severity. The point I wanna make uh, in addition to, to that is that the Feather River drains into the Oroville Dam, which is the largest reservoir uh, by volume in the Sierra Nevadas. I should have looked it up. I can't remember millions and millions of people drink water from Oroville Dam or you know, grow crops with water from Oroville Dam. We will come for full circle back to this later in the talk, but um, the sort of teaser is that this was a place that experienced massive drought, followed by a very, very large flood event. And that was in 2017. And now we're getting this overlay of disturbance, right? So disturbance on top of our mountain forests that are draining down into critical reservoirs. Okay. 
think that's all my background here to get, oh no, one more water supply. So I think this one is intuitive to Utahns and Nevadans, right? Uh, we store a lot of, we have to store our mountain water supplies because the water comes out of the mountains. The people live in the low elevations, right? Broad generalizations, but water comes in in the winter broadly, melts in the spring. We're holding that water in large reservoirs like Lake Powell, Lake Mead to release it oftentimes in the hottest times of the year when we need that water. And most water in the West is used for agriculture. We have big cities in the West, we have a lot of industry in the West, but it's important to keep in mind that about 80, eh, depends what numbers you use, but we'll say about 80% of, of water supplies in the West are for agriculture. So that's the setup. We have water supply challenges from the mountains and we have disturbance on top of it. What I wanna spend today talking with you about is the water supply management effects and response. So what are the effects of these disturbances on water supplies? How do we improve our water management and infrastructure to meet these challenges from disturbance? And where are the opportunities? Now I'm kind of, yesterday I guess was supposed to be more of a general audience sort of presentation. Today I'm, I'm really talking to sort of scientists and researchers trying to share sort of where I think there might be opportunities for uh, improved research and research to application. There's a lot of ways you can kill trees. Um, and we're seeing most of them right now. Uh, this is, this is a, a nice graphic um, from a colleague, um, just trying to give you a sense of um, different kinds of disturbances, right? It's just a visual, but what I like in the context of this talk is it's also giving you a sense of the complexity, right? We have sub, this is a three dimensional system that's interacting with the atmosphere. You have disturbance, you have surface water, groundwater. So this uniqueness of place aspect really arises from watershed characteristics, the subsurface, the ecosystem that was there before. And I'm back to Sarah Goking's figure from this uh, review paper, um, trying to think about what these disturbances do to stream flow, what these disturbances do to the pieces of the water cycle that we really manage, which is really surface water and to a lesser degree groundwater. And Sarah did a really nice job breaking, part, breaking apart the different components that could go into a stream flow change. So when you get disturbance, you can have changes in soil evaporation, you can have changes in the understory of apotranspiration and changes in the overstory of apotranspiration. And each of those has different components, transpiration, evaporation, sublimation. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about snowpack today because it's important, because I like snow, but, but also because it's, a, it's kind of a cheat way to, to look at some of this because yes, there's a uniqueness of place aspect to, um, to snow, the vegetation, all of that, but we're, we kind of get to skip some of the subsurface complexities that um, are really, really challenging. So I'm going to take on snow in a lot of this talk um, as our sort of hydrological response variable. So thinking about snow sublimation off the snowpack and uh, from the canopy. Okay, so what, I, what I'm gonna do is kind of give a, a little discussion of some of the remote sensing techniques I use before going to talk a little bit about the physical modeling that I use. And then really the machine learning sorts of things are actually kind of combining remote sensing with that physical modeling. But the setup is that we are struggling to make predictions of disturbance hydrology. This is uh, a map of uh, uh, mortality, or I guess they're calling it damage from insect disturbance. And my setup for the talk without a lot of background 
is that I've done two studies looking at um, pine beetle disturbance in sort of the northern part of the Colorado Rockies and spruce beetle disturbance in the southern part of the Colorado Rockies. I'm not going to really give much background about what was done, but I'll explain these figures all uh, have watersheds listed on the horizontal axis. And these C dash watersheds are the control watersheds. And then the different bars are just different empirical ways to estimate change. And, and the vertical, the, the, the height of the bar, the vertical axis is the change in stream flow. That doesn't really matter too much. The point I'm really trying to drive home here is that two kinds of insect disturbance, really close to each other, very similar climate. And in the pine beetle affected forests, we're seeing generally a decrease in stream flow. You drive a few hundred miles south to the spruce beetle forest, and we're seeing an increase in stream flow. So this presents some challenges because the type of disturbance is the same. I mean, they're, they're two different kinds of beetles, but they're both insect cause mortality. The severity of the disturbance is, is relatively similar, 30 to 50% mortality of the trees, but the hydrologic response is very different. And this is really a confounding problem for hydrologists, eco-hydrologists, ecologists, reservoir managers, because we need to not only know the magnitude of the, I mean, we can't predict the magnitude of the change well, but we're having a hard time predicting if there'll be more or less water. So I'm trying to use this as sort of the setup of why this is such a hard problem. Um, explaining this is important and it's hard. And I'll come back to this at sort of the end of the talk to try to kind of give you more answers than just questions. but. I wanna set it up with you all thinking about having these kind of challenges of sort of different sign of response from very similar kinds of disturbance. I showed this figure yesterday. I'm gonna make kind of the same point with this figure. Uh, this is a paper by Park Williams in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And really the point I'm making off this figure is has to do with the scatter of this relationship. So, this is a similar metric of change in um, stream flow after disturbance on the vertical axis and then percent forest area burn. So now the disturbance vector is wildfire. This is the left-hand panel is immediately after the fire and the right-hand panel is a longer window after the fire. The take home, and I made this point yesterday is yes, you do see a linear relationship, but the scatter is quite high. So you're only explaining about 30% of the of the variance. And I think what's more concerning is that you can have low disturbance and have decreases and big increases, right? And you can have high disturbance and have effectively no change in big increases. So it's the scatter of that that I think is concerning to me as a, as a hydrologist because giving the mean value um, may be very misleading, you know, if you are one of these edge cases. And um, certainly that's not what the water supply forecasters would like, right? They want you to, they want to shrink that uncertainty. They want you to give, you, uh, give an answer that uh, has, cert has more certainty than this. I'm gonna make effectively the same case here with snow. And I showed this uh, figure again yesterday, but snow is in some ways a, a simple, a simpler, uh, analogous system to stream flow because it's really only act interacting with the surface. So we have all the complexities of disturbance type, disturbance severity, uniqueness of place, but it's a simpler system because we're not thinking about what happens as so much after the snow melt and where that water goes, which adds much more complexity. That being said, we have some pretty complex processes going because they're, they can be interacting and acting in different ways. So uh, we have effectively interception in the uh, trees, reducing the amount of snow that makes it to the ground. But then we have um, sheltering of the snow that does make it to the ground, right? So if you make it, if you make it, if you're a snowflake and you make it to the snowpack here, you're being shaded by the trees. 
The, the trees are changing the wind field, reducing the, the wind and turbulence at the snow surface. And you effectively have these sort of interacting, counteracting processes. And what we've known from studying snow and forests now for several decades is that depending on what climate you're in, what forest structure you're in, some of these processes will become more dominant or less dominant. And um, that interplay then controls effectively how much snow there is. And people have been looking at this for a long time. Um, this is a really nice paper by Andres Varhola, uh, where he takes every one of these dots is like a master's thesis. <laughs> it's like somebody went out to the field, measured a whole bunch of things. Sometimes they had, it, this, yeah, I don't have time to totally explain this, but sometimes they're looking at disturbance experiments where they have a like an actual disturb site and a control site. And sometimes they're they're really doing more of like a, a space for time thing where they have a controlled open site and they have sites of different uh, forest density. But the general rule here is that if you take out canopy, you get more snow. And that's because you're effectively reducing this canopy interception. So interception in the canopy goes down because you have less canopy. The amount of snow on the ground accumulating goes up. Ablation is the mass loss of snowpack. So it can happen through melt or sublimation. Um, we can think of this more as like the melt rate, this bottom panel. And it shows that if you were to take out canopy, uh, you get faster snow melt, higher ablation rates. So you can think of this as you're effectively removing this uh, sheltering tree. You don't, you maybe don't have the same shadows on the surface. Maybe your wind fields have changed and increased and you are effectively melting the snowpack faster. So that's nice. We have these sort of rules of thumb, right? Unfortunately, we have the same problem I showed in the, in the previous two figures where you can have a medium amount of disturbance, like 50% loss of forest cover and have sort of no change or a negative change or a positive change. And it's really this, this right-hand side that's a little easier to see. So, you know, the same amount of disturbance can cause sort of wildly different changes in snowpack response. And, and the same being true for the ablation rates. So I guess there's, there's sort of multiple questions that arise, right? Why is there the variability there? Um, but I think the, the question that I'm more interested in, in driving at here is how do we build tighter relationships so that we can have these sorts of simpler rules of thumb, but the scatter is sort of of the order of like that we need in prediction. One of the tools that I, I think really has brought a lot of information into remote sensing, is, I'm sorry, into snow hydrology is remote sensing. And this, this uh, multi-panel here is a little bit uh, busy, but it's really just showing multiple ways of looking at a area that has been treated by mechanical thinning. So it's difficult to see here, but they've gone in and they've open these large serial gaps here. This is the um, original, this is the post-treatment. And then I'm mapping, really a postdoc I'm working with, Keotech, is mapping this with different remote sensing technologies. So we have LIDAR, Landsat is a satellite-based uh, multispectral imager. Avaris is an airplane-based hyperspectral imager. And you're getting different kinds of information from these different remote sensing um, platforms. I could spend a lot more time talking about that, but really what I want to drive at is the value of light detection and ranging as a remote sensing tool. It's, it's really, I think, been revolutionary in the forestry world. Um, you can do all sorts of forest mapping, biomass mapping. Um, the forestry companies, you know, do this on their own private land. Um, but you can also go out and fly the LIDAR when there's snow on the ground. And so now you're going to get a map of the height of the snowpack. If you were to difference that with a snow-free uh, flight, now you have a sort of wall-to-wall -wall map of the snow depth. 
and the forest structure at the same time. And not only that, it's at a very fine spatial scale. So one of the cases that I'm going to make to you is that this Landsat scale of about 30 meters on a side is really challenging because you can have many different kinds of forest structure within that, that larger pixel. Whereas if you're down at this LIDAR scale of one meter or sub one meter, you're actually seeing a lot of the tree scale processes. That's what I'm trying to get across in this uh, figure on the left from Niwot Ridge in Colorado that um, the LIDAR data really lets you zoom in and start to see these different patterns from different processes. So wind is moving snow from left to right, and it's um, effectively scouring the snow um, on the right-hand side here. Uh, the, the sun angle is changing the, the amount of radiation. You get more radiation uh, on the south-facing side of these clearings. That changes the snowpack processes. And then in these smaller gaps where you don't have as much sun and wind effect, you're, you're just seeing sort of preferential accumulation in these open areas. So, wow, we get to like see a lot, right? But I think as, uh, as probably a lot of grad students in the room can relate, it's like these things are so exciting when you look at it. And then it's like, what do you do with all that information, right? Like, how do you turn this into something that's simple enough to understand? And it's hard, you know, I think my, my advice there is that um, it's taking me years to come up with things that I don't even think are that clever. So it, it is like one of these things that um, you, you, it takes some creativity of how to take all this data and turn it into information, right? Information, data to information to knowledge, right? And um, I'm going to give you an example here uh, of one way we've done this with just sort of raw LIDAR data. This is work by Kara Piskey, who is a graduate student, well, former graduate student, just defended, um, working in Sage Hen Creek Experimental Watershed. You can see where that is right here on the nook of California. This is the Truckee River. Reno is kind of right where my cursor is right there. And this is a US Forest Service experimental watershed. They had a really progressive director at one point that was able to get a lot of money together to do sort of experimental treatments on the watershed. And it's a much longer story than I have to tell, but they, you know, these treatments, this is about a 30 square kilometer area. So these treatments are on the order of 10 to 15 square kilometers. It seems like a lot, it was very, expensive, millions of dollars, but I'll show you in a second, this is just sort of a small area when you think about all the forests of the Sierra Nevada. So the black lines are the forest treatments. We have light detection and ranging, LIDAR before the treatments, after the treatments. We can difference those two and we can look at where they pulled the biomass out. We can compare that to what they said they were gonna do, the forest planning, lots of interesting things there. But what we were really after was trying to think about how snowpack may have changed or um, how we might predict these kinds of forest restoration effects in other places using snow on LIDAR data. So I've been uh, fortunate to be in this area where when we've had multiple airborne snow observatory flights. And so we have several snow on flights from a couple of different years. As an aside that I'm very proud of, Kara Piskey got a job with the Airborne Snow Observatory. So I have, a, I have an in now there. Uh, the, 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 my former graduate student that did this work is now working for the Airborne Snow Observatory. It used to be part of NASA. It's now a private company. Um, and this is what I meant about clever, but not that clever. I mean, what we're doing is not complex. The, the, the issue is that you have areas where you have low vegetation. You have vegetation in the sort of height range that snow exists, right? So if you were to come in and look at the snow layer right here, or I'm sorry, the, the returns off the, the snow on LIDAR returns, you it would be very hard to know if they were hitting a, a branch or if they were hitting the top of the snow. So we effectively just do, applied a filtering algorithm that is saying, Okay, well, we know in some places there aren't low branches. 
So we're gonna use those places and exclude the places where we have this confounding problem of low branches. And what that means is you end up with a lot of sort of white, no data space. And that seems like a problem, but when you have millions and millions and millions of data points, you can sort of overwhelm some of that missing data with like law of large numbers types approaches. So this is what we did. She developed this filtering uh, algorithm and we used that to develop a snow and eventually a snow water equivalent or SWE map that's telling you how much water is in, in the snowpack. So that, that's what this is, uh, mapping snow water. Well, I guess this says snow depth, yeah. Apparently this is snow depth across the whole watershed. And then in the black box, we're zooming in to a, to a smaller place, just giving you the sense of the large scale variability and the small scale variability. This is another way to show it. This is very typical of Western uh, snowpacks where you have much more snow at the high elevations than at the low elevations. And you're retaining much more snow on the north facing slopes than on the south facing slopes. So we have a snow map, we have a lot of data, we've filtered out the data that we don't trust, but now we have to get the signal out of the noise, right? Because there is a lot of topographic information in there that's driving the snow distribution and we're trying to pull out the effects of vegetation. So the way that we do this or that Kira did this was, kind of to match the Andres Varhola sorts of approaches uh, shown in this, uh, the figure I showed previously, where you are in a 30 meter pixel and you find an open area and you use that open area as a control. So every 30 meter area has an open control site. And then you compare the snow in the whole 30 meters to that open control with the idea that the vegetation is, is effectively causing that difference between the open area and the average of the 30 meter pixels. So that's what this Y axis is. It's the percent change or percent difference between the open control area and the whole 30 meter pixel. And then every one of these blue dots is a 30 meter pixel, right? So we have, I can't remember, I think it's 30,000 or something like that. Um, and what was very encouraging to us was that we got relationships that aren't that scattered um, and relationships that generally match the Varhola relationship where as you have more and more vegetation, you have larger and larger differences between your open control and the whole area. So this is suggesting that in places that have 75% vegetation cover, you're, you're on the order of sort of 20% reductions in snowpack as compared to an open area. So one then could argue if you were to clear that entire area, you should see about a 20% increase in snow. So why we're excited about this is we're effectively back to this sort of simple characterization of how snow varies, but we're doing it now in a very placed-based way that, it, that could be applied to that place rather than having to deal with uh, the scatter of this. So this has some real value to managing snow in Sagehen. And I think that's my next slide. Yeah, so what we can do, I won't spend too much time on this, but we, we put this into a random forest model we build these partial plots and we use the relationships between this delta accumulation that I showed previously and the fraction of vegetation openness has to do with the, op the size of the clearings relative to the height of the trees, um, effectively vegetation structure information to identify sort of low response, moderate response and high response areas on the landscape. And we combine F, F, F veg, the fractional veg with the openness metric. And we're able to then map, this is a little hard to see, but uh, the left-hand panel is low response, moderate response in the middle, high response on the right. So if you were going to prioritize, you'd prioritize these high response areas. And then we're able to kind of think about in a post-restoration, post, post -restoration how 
the areas that they thin matched up to areas that we identified as, as high, um, high response. And um, so this has, has a couple values to it. You could uh, go out after the restoration and sort of evaluate whether you thin the right areas. I think more ideally, you would use this information in the planning stages to plan where you're going to do these forest restorations and potentially how you're going to do the forest restoration. And I'll come back to this a little bit in terms of like how we scale this up and take it to other places. But I think the value of this is that we built some, some information that could help forest restoration in that particular area, effectively just using remote sensing data. Okay, so that's my plug for the value of remote sensing for this effort. The next piece here is going black again, uh, <laughs> physical modeling. So um, we run a, a physical model that my colleague Patrick Broxton developed called Snow Palm, Snow Physics and Airborne Laser Mapping. So what it's doing is it's taking this LIDAR data set, especially the vegetation structure information, it's putting that effectively in a three-dimensional model that is allowing shadows to get cast by the trees, wind to blow across, and then it's solving the energy and uh, water balance in each one meter pixel. And the value of this is that tree processes happen effectively at a tree scale. And this can resolve that scale of processes. Most hydrology models are at 100, 1,000 meters. And so you're lumping all of this together. And uh, in this, we can, we can really look at the processes. So it, it really opens the door for a couple of modeling exercises. Probably the most obvious would be to take pre-fire LIDAR and post-fire LIDAR and run the model, you know, kind of for the same weather and climate and think about how would snow change following a massive wildfire in New Mexico. Uh, this is some work by Dave Meiser, um, where we did that and we're able to show the spatial patterning of change in snowpack following fire. Uh, I guess the point I would make here is that we see both increases and decreases, right? And one could imagine these sort of increases and decreases sort of adjacent to each other would not be resolvable with a coarser model. Um, yeah, we could have a longer conversation if, if those coarser models can even really get the physics right, but they certainly wouldn't, they certainly would struggle to get these like uh, close proximity changes. The other way that we've done this, so that's kind of a post disturbance evaluation. The other way that we've done this is sort of in a planning mode where uh, we, we were working on the west shore of Lake Tahoe. We calibrated the model. We've done some calibrations and whatnot, uh, validation to the model. But we're doing what we call virtual thinning. And it sounds pretty simple. It actually was pretty hard to, to put into motion. But you go out, you map each individual tree. So you know basically how tall the trees are. And then you start cutting the trees down in your virtual computer space. And so... Working with the Forest Service, what we did is we came up with two simple scenarios. And I'm not going to argue whether how realistic they are, but where we took out every tree shorter than 10 meters, and then we took out every tree shorter than 20 meters, and we compared that back to the pre-existing as our control. So you can sort of see what what that looks like. Um, I thought I had that on. I I, I do have a slide later, but. What, so we're doing this and we're effectively looking at the snowpack response to these forest thinnings. And I'll show you some of these results in a second. But these are the two ways that we've been applying this physical model, uh, kind of in a pre and post disturbance role, and then in a virtual disturbance role. And I'd love to hear from the audience if you guys can think of anything else. I'm starting to run out of ideas for how to apply this model. The remainder of the talk, the last 10 minutes or so, I, I want to go into the value of this for forest planning for water management. And I have three examples here that I'll, I'll show from the Sierra Nevada. This, uh, for reference, this is the former director of Sage Hen Creek Experimental Watershed and 
these are the kinds of um, uh, slash piles and um, uh, work that was being done in Seichen. So this is back to Karapiski's work with the low, high, uh, low, moderate, high response areas. But now we've taken our model that we developed for this little area right here at about 30 square kilometers, and we've taken it up to something on the order of about 150 square kilometers. And I, I guess I'm trying to give the sense here of how complex it is to do this at landscape scales, right? Because we have, I mean, you can't even see the topography here. The town of Truckee is right here. You have different forest types, different cover types. Um, you have historical fires. And then you, on top of that, have these polygons and these orange and red colors of where the Forest Service has either gone out and done restoration activities or is planning to do that. So we see this as potentially a tool that they could use to help with landscape sort of scale restoration planning, again, by prioritizing high versus low response. Now I'm gonna move down from Seichen to the west shore of Lake Tahoe. This is kind of my first experience on a collaborative um, forest restoration project. So uh, Lake Tahoe here on the right, the west shore is effectively the entire west shore of Lake Tahoe. The Sierra Crest is right here. So these are um, some of the taller mountain forests in this part of the Sierras. And we, it was a really interesting process where there were six teams. There was a team looking at fuels and fire, teams looking at water quality. I was the water quantity team, habitat, wildlife, carbon. And they're trying to put this all back together to give a plan for how to do forest restoration at this scale. We were really looking at snow, uh, trying to look at stream flow, but providing you know, one of the pieces of information to a much larger um, decision uh, making process. These are kind of the results that, uh, you know, yeah, I guess I'm trying to give a sense here. If, you, if you, all you had was the previous empirical results, the green dots are the four empirical um, uh, results, uh, previous studies in the Sierra Nevada. So this would be effectively all the information that you would have would be these four green dots. We went out and did this virtual thinning experiment. And that's what these lines are here is Sebastian Crow was a previous postdoc and he ran this over the entire West shore. And the point I wanna make is that you can, you have a large amount of variability depending on where you are in the watershed bounded by these two blue lines. And so I think these models really give a much richer picture than you could ever go out and get with just on the ground plot scale measurements um, because they're showing you the full spread and your, sort of your uncertainty around that change. In the same work by Sebastian, we developed a decision support tool for the Forest Service. And we work with them trying to think about, you know, the kind of common ground between simplicity and what we were trying to accomplish. And uh, what we ultimately provided was um, a, a, a tool like this that effectively talks about the, or estimates the change in the water input for a certain amount of thinning across elevations, across aspects. So the idea here is that they could really think about where they would get the most water value from forest restoration. And they could put that into that much more complicated, multifaceted forest restoration plan that they were developing. I'm currently sort of doing the next step up in scale from that. So Lake Tahoe is here. The West Shore project was just this little strip along the West Shore. The new restoration effort is called the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative. And one of the first thing we did there was we ran the full Tahoe Basin. And, uh, you know, it's like one of these like unfortunate results that's really intriguing scientifically, but you're like, oh gosh, what did we just bite off? So the first thing we mapped was comparing the West Shore versus the East Shore. The East Shore is much windier and drier. 
and um, they look completely different. They look completely different. You actually get more water when you thin the forest on the west shore, less water on the east shore. And this, I think, really gets at more of the challenge here of the sort of uniqueness of place. There are folks like Susan Dickerson Lang, Jessica Lundquist, that are trying to map at the full sort of Sierra Nevada scale of which areas may have positive responses to forest disturbance. And we're trying to go one step farther. This is the TCSI domain where we are bringing in the LIDAR forest structure information to really think about not only how do these climate factors like wind and precipitation and air temperature control these variable responses, but also how does the vegetation, the pre-existing vegetation structure. What this is showing is that we are starting to get, you know, that contrast between more snow from uh, thinning on the west shore and less on the east shore. This is work that's uh, still in preparation. Okay, I think this is my last example here. I mean, so how do we build a model that can make predictions everywhere? This is really the riddle that I've been thinking about a lot. So going back to some of this previous work by Aidan Manning in the Colorado Rockies, looking at insect disturbance, we really want a model that can tell us that snow might increase in the spruce beetle disturbance, but decrease from the pine beetle disturbance. So what we're effectively doing now is merging the LIDAR information with our physical models and then running the model many, many, many times in many different scenarios. So in different domains uh, and with different kinds and um, types and uh, severity of disturbance. Then we're gonna put that all back into a machine learning algorithm where hopefully we can have a decision support tool that cuts across the uniqueness of place issues um, in this sort of spine of the, of the Rockies here. We would really like to have a model that you could you know, take out to any conifer forest in the Rocky Mountains here and make a prediction with some reliability. I'm gonna skip that one. So we're still kind of in the rudimentary stages of this and no offense to Sarah because Sarah's bringing this on, but I would argue we're, we're just starting to realize that climate is a big control and has sort of systematic effects. If you're in a very dry place, you're gonna not have as much benefit from thinning. Disturbance severity we're seeing also as being a control. But these watershed characteristics, these uniqueness of place issues remain a real challenge for us. And so I think this work by Janang Rin, who's now at the University of Nevada, Reno, was previously at Washington State University, is, is starting to, to get at something similar with insect disturbance in the Pacific Northwest. You have uh, climate drivers, aridity drivers, mortality levels, and that's ultimately the interactions of all of those are controlling whether you're getting an increase or a decrease in water yield. So building decision support tools like this is very helpful. You'll notice though that this, there's no magnitude of change here. I'm gonna run out of time like usual. All right, I said I would bring it back to the pine beetle stuff that I started the talk with. So this is Aidan Manning's paper that came out last year. And um, this is the point I've been trying to make to water managers and I'd love feedback on this, but yeah, sometimes we see big difference. This is the Conejos, big differences, 37% more stream flow following disturbance. That is 200%. So that's two times the amount of water that the largest reservoir in that basin can store. So, yeah, okay, that's not surprising. But the Rio Grande here, the RG, not a statistically significant change, okay? So we didn't have enough statistical power, but if you just take the, the average change of 6.7% increase in the Rio Grande, that is about what 40,000 acre feet or about 30% of that basin's reservoir storage. These are big, big numbers. Um, and they are not in our reservoir planning at all. I mean, the, the folks that are having to make these decisions about 
how to release water, when to release water are not, they do not have concrete information about changes from disturbance. In that case, we're really on the right side of this. We're really concerned about just having enough water for water supplies. In the Sierra Nevada, we get the double whammy. We have to manage for floods and we have to manage for water supplies. And I mentioned Oroville Dam, the Feather River, those massive disturbances. Oroville Dam is uh, well known now for having a spillway catastrophe in 2017. And now we've just had two of the largest fires in California history in that upper basin. And really water managers don't have any more tools to make predictions there. We're moving into a world where we have to use better science. We have to use better predictions to, to do better water supply management. Forecast inform reservoir operations are sort of the cutting edge of this. The idea being that instead of having simple rule curves like this orange line that tells you when you have to release from the reservoir for safety concerns, that we could actually use our better forecasting, both weather and hydrology, to take that little blip of water where they had to release and actually hold that for later for water supply. But you can see, right, you run into this issue of you don't want to hold too much water or you can get uh, flood damage. And uh, if you don't hold enough water, you don't get enough water in your reservoir when you need it. So this is really, I find, I find it to be like applications and science just coming together, right? Forecasting is both operations and science, I think in kind of a clear form. And we're doing this now in the Tahoe Central Sierra Initiative. Our thought bringing it full circle is how might these forest restoration landscape scale affect reservoir inflows, peak flows, and therefore forecast informed reservoir operations. Okay, so this is my conclusion slide. Uh, same as I started with, we have this trifecta of complexity, disturbance type, severity, can uniqueness of place. The uniqueness of place one seems to be the most challenging. We can get at some of the disturbance stuff through remote sensing. We're still really challenged by how we characterize unique places. But regardless of that, we have to bring the uncertainty bounds down in our, in our predictions because we're entering a world where water is only more precious and uh, more important to manage. And uh, with that, I will stop and take questions. Any questions for Adrian? I'm gonna run the mic so that folks on Zoom 